Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from JNJ Global. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Jiwon Oh, Associate Professor in the Division of Neurology at St. Michael's Hospital at the University of Toronto in Canada. I'm also medical director of the Multiple Sclerosis Program at St. Michael's Hospital. Welcome to this program titled Tailoring Management Strategies for My Patients with Multiple Sclerosis. I'm delighted uh, that joining me today is uh, Dr. Friedman Paul, who is Professor of Clinical Neuroimmunology at Charité University in Berlin and he is group leader of the Experimental and Clinical Research Center at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin, Germany. Welcome, Professor Paul. Thank you very much. So uh, today, uh, we wanted to talk about a number of things about the evolving treatment landscape in multiple sclerosis. Um, as many of you know, it's been a very exciting time in MS therapeutics. Um, and the MS field is one of the few uh, neurological disorders where there really has been an incredible explosion of uh, available therapies um, for both relapsing and uh, um, some therapies for progressive MS. So it's been a very fortunate time because there are many, many therapeutic options in comparison to what was available uh, two decades ago. However, uh, with increasing uh, choice, um, things become a bit more complex. And there are a number of things that um, we as uh, care providers um, need to keep in mind um, when thinking about what uh, therapeutic agents may be best for an individual patient. Um, some of the things that we need to keep in mind include the patient's disease characteristics, um, hidden symptoms, um, patient's personal preferences, um, the life stage that they may be in, and uh, comorbidities, and the list go on. So with that introduction, um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Paul, um, when we're considering treatments in MS, whether it's a first-line treatment, when you're starting somebody on a new MS therapy, or when you're thinking about switching treatment in somebody who is already on a therapy, what, what sort of factors do you need to take into account? Thank you very much, uh, G1, for bringing up this, this uh, truly relevant question. Um, let's start perhaps on the, on the side of the, uh, of the disease in terms of there are various disease-related factors that, that should be taken into consideration. For example, the history of relapses, the severity of relapses, but also aspects such as MRI activity, for example. Is this a patient with a high lesion load with contrast-enhancing lesions or a patient with a low lesion load? Do um, a spinal cord lesions occur, et cetera, et cetera. And also the question whether a patient has responded favorably to a relapse treatment, for example, with uh, corticosteroids is relevant, remission of relapses in, in, in the past, et cetera. On the side of the patient, the demographics, so to speak, there are issues such as um, age and, and uh, sex or gender and comorbidities. Uh, thank you, uh, Friedman, for highlighting many of the different uh, initial factors about um, uh, the patient's disease, as well as patient-specific factors that we think about when trying to select a therapy. Um, now, in terms of other um, personal factors that we may take into account, um, are there other things outside of, say, um, a patient's disease activity or other kind of uh, factors that we use to prognosticate how we think an individual will do that you take into account when you're thinking about different therapy uh, choices? Yes, ab absolutely. So, so um, um, this, this pertains to the patient perspective on the disease and on the treatment of the disease. So first of all, there are, and you already mentioned that G1, the covert hidden symptoms such as fatigue, depression, sleep disorders, et cetera, et cetera, 
that, of course, are very difficult to treat with the classic immunomodulatory um, drugs we have, but would um, make a difference whether we choose drug A or drug B. Another issue is uh, patient preferences in terms of the mode of administration. Is this oral? Is this IV? Is this sub-Q? Um, the frequency of administration, all these are issues that need to be discussed with our patient in, in a scenario of what we would call a shared decision making. Additional uh, points for consideration are, um, for example, the age. Um, 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 if a patient, a female patient, uh, wishes to conceive pregnancy issues, et cetera, et cetera. So all this needs to be on the table when we um, discuss treatment options with our patient. Thank you, Friedman. Um, you've really highlighted many of the uh, points that we take into account. And as you can see, it's not just uh, one or two different factors, it's many different factors that you really need to consider. And this is because in the field of MS, we really are trying to move towards a personalized medicine. Um, can I ask you as a clinician, do you find that patients have a very uh, different attitude about risk? Um, just because, um, you know, obviously we think about many different things with the patient's disease activity and you as their neurologist may have an opinion about what sort of therapy that um, they should start. But do you find that, um, you know, the patient's kind of perception or attitude towards uh, therapy risk influences your treatment uh, suggestion? Yes, absolutely. This is a very good question. And, and let me put it this way. I would say there's a very um, broad spectrum um, of, of personalities in terms of how risk averse a patient is. Okay, um, one side of the or one end of the spectrum is a patient who is uh, very much concerned about side effects, and and this is the, the the paramount let's say factor that would would lead to a decision. And, and on the other side of the spectrum is a patient who um, has more aggressive disease and who would tell me give me anything that works to halt this disease, to control this disease, whatever the theoretical uh, side effects may be, okay? And, and that's the, the, the range of personalities we have to deal with. And I think there is no one size fits all approach. So we need to find out what, what type of, of, of personality a patient has and whether he or she is more on the risk averse side or more on the side of let's nail down this disease, let's halt this disease at, at whatever costs may come up. I completely agree with you, Friedman. It always uh, shocks me in clinical practice to see um, the wide spectrum of personalities. And um, often it, you know, um, as a neurologist, we end up uh, um, kind of gauging a lot of different things about, um, you know, the person with MS in front of us. And uh, really that kind of attitude towards risk um, does influence uh, treatment choice quite often. And I think you said this earlier, um, I think this concept of shared decision making is really important in that sense, because I think um, in medicine, we are moving um, away from a more kind of uh, maternalistic or paternalistic mo model of care um, towards one where there really is um, a lot of interaction and back and forth. And particularly in an area like MS, where there is so much treatment choice, um, it makes a lot of sense to uh, really make a shared decision when it comes to something like therapy. Well, what just comes to my mind, um, there were publications already 20 years ago, and they were echoed by more recent publications on the disagreement of the relevance of bodily symptoms, you know, between patients and physicians. For example, physicians, and this is truly my experience, we tend to, to, to rate, uh, for example, ambulation or walking impairment a lot more uh, relevant or a lot more seriously than, uh, for example, a pain or, or fatigue or other issues uh, or vision, uh, visual impairment, okay? And, and patients have a different view on, on their bodily symptoms than physicians in many cases. So we need to ask our patients how they view their disease and what this means then in terms of treatment. And I think a really important point, um, Friedman, because uh, if you look at um, you know, the scales that we've uh, relied on heavily in clinical trial settings and even in the clinic, um, because uh, we as physicians tend to think that ambulation is you know, um, the most important factor, um, that really weighs our scales like the EDSS a lot. But um, um, like you said, when you actually ask patients um, their prioritization of the importance of um, different symptoms is, is very different. And uh, I think a really important point that this is where we really need to listen 
um, to patients because um, prioritization of different symptoms can, as you heard, be very different. All right, so um, uh, you know, as we alluded to earlier, we know that um, the current treatment landscape of MS is very busy and it's becoming busier. Um, and it changes on a regular basis. But um, as of now, um, around the world, and obviously depending on what area you are, there are differences in what um, therapies are available. Um, but generally, uh, many of these um, newer therapies are either already available in different areas or um, going to be available very soon. So as a quick kind of summary, what disease modifying treatments do we have um, right now? Um, well, um, in most parts of the world, we do have our traditional, um, what many people refer to as first line therapies, um, which are the uh, injectable agents, which consist of the various interferon agents, as well as glutaramer acetate, and uh, two oral therapies, um, dimethyl fumarate and terraflunamide. Um, we also have a number of therapies, both oral and uh, infusion and uh, injection therapies, um, that many people uh, typically been in what we call the higher efficacy disease modifying treatments. And this is largely based on um, clinical trials where they've either been tested against an active comparator or there have been subgroup analyses suggesting that they are um, effective against highly active disease. So as you can see, um, the treatment landscape, we are very fortunate um, um, because there are so many different options, um, but it has also become uh, more complicated in terms of decision making. Um, so in terms of some of these um, newer, higher efficacy therapies, uh, Friedman, can I ask you, what do we need to watch for in terms of um, adverse uh, effects um, that can be associated with some of these therapies? Yes, thank you, Jiwon, for this very important question. As you said, it's fortunate that we have these new drugs at hand, but of course, uh, we need to um, thoroughly weigh the risk-benefit ratio in these uh, newer drugs, and there are particular aspects. I, I, don't want to touch upon each of these drugs in, in, in much detail for the sake of time now, but there are a couple of issues we need to, to, to bear in mind. This is, first of all, the risk of opportunistic infections, for example, PML with natalizumab, but perhaps also with the S1P receptor modulators and also with the other drugs. There are issues with um, hypogammaglobulinemia, for example, with ofatumumab, uh, rituximab, and, and, and ocrelizumab. Um, perhaps on the long-term uh, neoplastic um, uh, complications, although the data is quite scant on this, and uh, specific to the uh, S1P receptor modulators issues such as macular edema, uh, bradycardia, and pe perhaps AV uh, uh, blocks, etc. So all this needs to be taken into consideration and needs to be adjudicated against the background of perhaps um, concomitant diseases the patient has, co-medication co the patient is taking, uh, the age of the patient, and of course, and again, patient preferences as to the side effects. And again, you bring up a really important point. Um, in the end, it becomes a balance of uh, risk and benefit in an individual patient when you consider um, other comorbidities that they may have that may predispose them to some of these adverse effects. So um, let's focus on the newer therapies and uh, that um, have emerged on the market and what they might add to our treatment options. And so specifically uh, for the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to focus on some of the newer S1P receptor modulators, including Ozanimod as well as Panesimod, and then this new anti-CD20 agent, uh, Ofatumumab. Um, so I'd just like to start with Ozanimod. And just to um, um, give our audience a brief overview, Ozanimod is, um, um, you, you know, you can think of it as a newer version of uh, a, a drug that we're actually quite familiar with, Fingolimod. Um, so Fingolimod was the first um, oral therapy and first S1P receptor modulator that has been used in MS, and it's actually been available for over a decade. Um, these newer S1P receptor modulators, though, have the benefit of more selectivity because obviously in the MS world, we're very interested in modulating S1P receptors because they can prevent um, lymphocytes from coming out of the lymph nodes. And we want to do this in MS because we want to prevent um, pathogenic lymphocytes from entering the central nervous system. But um, outside of the lymph nodes, they actually can have many different systemic effects, including in the heart, um, other central nervous systems tissue and other uh, systemic effects. 
Um, so there may theoretically be a benefit of additional safety with some of these more um, restricted S1P receptor modulators. And Ozanimod is an example of one of these, and it actually focuses mainly on S1P1 uh, and 5 uh, receptors. Um, and it's been thoroughly tested in a, a pretty robust clinical development program. Um, as with almost all therapies in MS, it started with um, a phase two trial that was termed uh, radiance. And um, when that um, interim analysis looked the way it should, immediately the clinical development program actually went into recruiting for the phase three trial, which was actually radiance the phase three trial. Um, then there was another uh, phase three trial by the name of Sunbeam that was a duration of one year, while the radiance phase three trial was a duration of two years. So Friedman, can you summarize for us uh, some of the main results from the Ozanamod clinical development program? Thank you very much. I'll focus on the radiance trial. Um, uh, this was, a, as you said, a, a, a two-year trial uh, uh, with two doses of Ozanimod versus uh, interferon um, beta 1a. So um, the patients who um, were diagnosed with MS and were aged between 18 and 55 and had an EDSS of 0 to 5.0 were randomized 1 to 1 to 1 to 0 0.5 or 1 milligrams of Ozanimod or um, weekly interferon beta 30 micrograms um, intramuscularly. The primary endpoint here was the um, annualized relapse rate over 24 months. And the uh, key results were as follows. So um, both doses of Ozanimod were superior to um, uh, intramuscular um, um, interferon beta 1a um, with regards um, to um, the relapse rates and also with regards to uh, brain MRI endpoints, for example, T2 lesions and gadolinium enhancing lesions, um, Ozanimod was superior to inter interferon beta um, 1a, highly statistically um, significant. Although um, um, the, the delta, so the absolute difference in terms of relapse rates between um, Ozanimod and interferon beta 1a intramuscularly was not that impressive. Thanks for that overview, uh, Friedman. And would you mind also just uh, briefly summarizing um, uh, the Panesimod clinical trial, which again is another more selective S1P receptor um, agonist molecule that um, has emerged um, in the MS therapeutic landscape? Thank you very much. Indeed, this was the uh, very recently published Optimum study. So again, um, this was Panesimod, and now here compared to uh, teriflunomide in contrast to the other studies that, that had uh, the intramuscular interferon beta 1a. Again, patients with relapsing multiple sclerosis uh, between 18 and 55 years of age and an EDSS of 0 to 5.5 were randomized 1 to 1 to 20 milligrams of panisimod versus 40 milligrams of teriflunomide once daily for 108 weeks. And again here, as with the other drugs, the primary endpoint was the annualized uh, relapse rates. And uh, panisimod was superior to teriflunomide, highly statistically significant in terms of um, relapse rate reduction. Um, um, again, the delta, the absolute difference was, was, was minor, but still um, the data are quite impressive and clearly show a superiority of Panesimod. Thank you, Friedman. And would you mind uh, just briefly going over the safety profile of both um, Ozanimod as well as Panesimod? Does it differ at all from what we're already familiar with with uh, Fingolimod? So, so yeah, thank you. This is an important issue. So. Um, with, with Ozanimod, in principle, there were no serious um, infections or, or serious um, adverse cardiac events. There was a, um, a slight reduction of um, heart rates that was, you know, expected and this, this pertains to the mode of action of the drug, but nothing in, indeed um, relevant. And with um, the other drug, with Ponesimod, this was um, also comparable to what was known from S1P. Um, there were no serious um, adverse events. It was more or less similar in both groups, so uh, ponizimod versus teriflunomide, although there was a slightly higher uh, treatment discontinuation rate in the ponizimod group. And the most commonly reported adverse events here were dyspnea, uh, increased liver enzymes, um, and macular edema, although the numbers were very small here. Also with ponizimod, there was a slight uh, but non-significant reduction of um, heart rates, uh, nothing that uh, caused any serious problems uh, and, and required medical interventions. 
Thank you, Friedman. And, um, you know, typically with uh, fingolimod, um, with the first dose um, in most parts of the world, it is required that you are monitored or undergo um, first dose observation for the first six hours. Um, is this similarly the case with the newer S1P receptor agonists? Um, this is this is not, at least here in Europe, um, not necessarily um, a mandated. Although um, I would recommend, you know, before physicians um, uh, gather more experience with this drug, that we might do this in, let's say, the first patients we treat. We treat with these two new S1P receptor modulators, but formally it's not mandated, unless there are certain. Uh, cardiac um, um, events in the past or so, which would of course then probably uh, be a contraindication. Thank you. And uh, it's similar in Canada as well, where um, we have Ozanimon now available. It's not actually mandated, um, but obviously if there's any uh, concerning um, cardiac history or, or if they're, they are on uh, specific medications, it probably is a good idea. But an illustration of the fact that I think both of these molecules, because of their selectivity, are thought to uh, maybe um, be a bit safer in terms of some of these um, um, side effects that you may observe. Um, just wanted to really briefly summarize the ofatumumab um, data for our audience. Um, as we've alluded to many times uh, before, ofatumumab is a, a different version um, of an anti-CD20 agent. Um, it is a, a subcutaneous injection that's in, self-administered uh, monthly. Uh, there is initially a loading dose of 20 milligrams per week, and then 20 milligrams is uh, injected monthly. Um, it is an anti-CD20 agent, and so because of the existence of ocrelizumab for a number of years, um, as well as um, an older version of an anti-CD20 agent, rituximab, in the MS field, we're quite familiar with it. Um, but this is um, different because it's a first full, fully human monoclonal antibody, um, which is supposed to be less immunogenic than some of the existing anti-CD20 agents. Um, and again, another key difference is the fact that it's administered subcutaneously and can be self-administered. So for some individuals, um, this may be a very convenient option because you don't need to uh, go into an infusion center. So ofatumumab was evaluated in two large phase three clinical trials in relapsing MS. Um, these trials were called Escalepios 1 and 2. Um, ofatumumab was compared to an active comparator of teraflunamide. And with the endpoints of interest, which include annualized relapse rate, as well as um, uh, MRI measures of interest, which include gadolinium enhancing lesions and newer enlarging T2 lesions, there was a significant effect uh, that was beneficial of ofatumumab uh, versus teraflunamide. Uh, specifically with a relapse rate, there was a reduction of about 51 to 58 percent. Um, and then uh, with MRI lesions, with GAD lesions specifically, there was a greater than 90 percent reduction of GAD lesions in ofatumumab treated patients versus teraflunamide treated patients. Um, and there was a significant effect of over um, 80 percent um, with respect to newer enlarging T2 lesions of ofatumumab treated patients versus teraflunamide treated patients. So very clearly, um, there was an effect of um, ofatumumab in relapsing MS with the endpoints of interest um, um, versus teraflunamide. In terms of adverse events, um, when you look at the totality of adverse events, um, the, the rate of AEs um, was very similar. And when you look at serious AEs, this was also very similar. In the phase three clinical trials, there were no deaths. Um, there were a handful of malignancies in each treatment arm, so both ofatumumab and teraflunamide. But importantly, there was no clustering of any malignancy, which is something that we get concerned about um, if we see the same type of malignancy but this was not the case, and none of the malignancies were deemed to be relevant to treatment. So, um, Friedman, with all of these different treatment options, um, what additional benefits do you think they can add to our uh, patients? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, G1. So, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's a great success and, and a big step forward that we have additional drugs and that, that our therapeutic armamentarium has, has significantly expanded. We have a lot more drugs now um, in, with different modes of action, with different modes of administration. So there's a lot more we can offer to our patient, and um, which means that we, we have made a big step forward towards a more individualized um, therapeutic approach 
that takes patient wishes and, and the preferences and so into consideration. I think it's also very fortunate that we have uh, oral drugs that are um, applicable to patients in early disease and that we have a drug such as ofatumumab that has the sub-Q option of administration, which, which is very convenient for patients. Thank you, Friedman. I think very nicely put. Ultimately, it allows us to um, um, individualize treatment um, for different patients much more effectively. So um, with that in mind, um, if we can just in the last few minutes, um, look at a few patient cases, and then if I can just get your opinion on uh, how you might manage them, uh, Friedman, that would be great. This is a real patient of mine, um, but I think it's a useful case to discuss. So this is a 32-year-old woman who about a year ago presented with sensory symptoms in her bilateral lower limbs as well as urinary symptoms. And these lasted for four weeks and then completely resolved. And she actually kind of shrugged it off at the time and didn't really do anything because it just got better. Um, but recently, she noticed that she had blurry vision in one eye. Um, it was There was pain with eye movement, and then this prompted her to seek medical care. She was told that she had um, optic neuritis and treated with steroids and then resolved. Um, a few weeks later, I was seeing her in our clinic, um, and at the time, she did have a left optic disc pallor, um, and she did have some decreased sensation in her distal lower limbs, and I graded her EDSS as 1.5 um, because of these findings. Um, when she got an MRI, um, her MRI of the brain uh, showed uh, between 5 and 10 uh, brain lesions. And then we also scanned her cervical spinal cord that showed a single lesion. And so um, given the outline of this case, which is probably a case that's very similar to uh, what many of you have in clinical practice, um, as an initial treatment, um, what would you consider, Friedman? Okay, very, very good, but also somewhat difficult question, and I'm happy to discuss that. And of course, this might might be seen controversially. So um, the key point for me is here that this patient has had two relapses, and that she has one spinal cord lesion. And um, so these are, despite her young age and her female sex, are somewhat less favorable prognostic um, factors, at least the spinal cord lesion. So. I would not recommend her to start with, for example, bacterial acetate or an interferon. I would either recommend a S1P, uh, either one of these new uh, oral S1P receptor modulators, or perhaps um, a drug such as ofatumumab or oxalizumab. And I am completely in agreement with you, um, given the frequency of her relapses, as well as the fact that she has a pretty moderate lesion burden already and a spinal cord lesion. This is someone I would be more worried about and if accessible would want to start on a therapy that I consider to be more highly efficacious. Um, can I ask you, Friedman, say the patient tells you that she's engaged, going to get married um, in a few months and hopes to start a family in the next two years, would this change what you think about or recommend for treatment? I mean, of, of course, this, this makes, makes decision making a lot more complicated and difficult because uh, almost all, if not all, um, immunomodulators are contraindicated, formally contraindicated during, during a pregnancy and some are also not, not well investigated uh, during breastfeeding or, or lactation. I would not um, recommend to postpone the start of immunomodulatory treatment until after her first pregnancy, because no one knows when this will you know, come to fruition, so to speak, okay? Um, there are options, for example, glatiromere acetate is relatively safe during pregnancy or is considered safe, probably also better interference. This might be an option. On the other hand, there would be the option to um, try to control the disease with a highly efficacious drug such as ocrelizumab or ofatumumab, then take her off once she is um, pregnant. Thank you for all your insights on this, Friedman. Um, and uh, I'm sure the audience can hear that, um, you know, certainly family planning makes decision making a bit more complicated. But again, this is why it's so beneficial that we have many different treatment options. And as you very nicely highlighted, um, there are, um, you know, data from around the world about the safety of some of these therapies. Um, again, you know, these data are never definitive, um, but we do have many different options that still can be used around the time of pregnancy planning, um, which, as Friedman says, is an, um, at least at one time point um, uh, an issue that comes up in most of our patients' lives. 
Um, can I ask you, say this patient complains of really difficult cognitive problems. She works as an accountant and she's having trouble keeping up with work. She specifically finds that she has word finding difficulties, memory issues, she can't multitask. Um, would this change uh, what you do in terms of management? Um, thank you. This is, this is a highly relevant question because uh, up to 70-80% of MS patients complain of, of fatigue and or cognitive impairment and most of them show some amount of, of uh, impairment on cognitive tests. So first of all, I would try to understand the background of cognitive impairment. I would do a cognitive testing, perhaps the BICAMS or the brief battery, or if there is any abnormality there, perhaps a more profound um, and more time consuming cognitive test, but I would try to understand what, what is going on. I would try to assess potentially confounding factors such as depression, such as sleep disorders, both, both, both of which contribute to uh, cognitive impairment. And if this patient has a, an objectifiable cognitive test that, that shows that, that, that there is cognitive impairment, I would probably have more arguments to put her on a more, on a more efficacious drug. So again, an argument to start, for, for example, with ofatumumab or prinizumab or something like that. With, you know, um, with the rationale in mind that an early control of disease activity would halt or perhaps even improve cognitive performance. Thanks, Friedman, and especially for talking about your general approach. Um, I think it's really informative for our audience that um, you want to first take the step of trying to understand um, exactly what she's describing and um, trying to make sure there aren't other reversible causes. And um, once you've uh, looked at that, um, you know, deciding on treatment, and um, it does sound like the presence of very clear cognitive deficits would influence your treatment decision um, towards a higher efficacy agent, which is exactly the same as what I would do. Um, just a note, um, you know, many of the earlier clinical trials did not um, uh, prospectively or proactively assess cognition in the phase three clinical trial, but in more uh, contemporary clinical trials, like um, in the Ozanimod clinical development program, there were actually cognitive tests that were built in um, as an exploratory outcome measure. And um, we now have the benefit of data showing that there does seem to be a benefit on cognition, at least in the shorter term of Ozanimod versus inter interferon um, in the uh, um, uh, Sunbeam um, and Radiance clinical trials. This was indeed a, 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 an improvement over, over older trials that cognitive assessment was, was done, for example, in the Radiance trial, where the SDMT, the symbol digit modalities test, uh, was, was applied, uh, widely used and, and widely validated in multiple uh, cultural settings, etc., and, and briefly to perform cognitive tests. Um, and there was a clear superiority of, of um, Ozanimod over, over the comparator in terms of improvement of the SDMT. So this is indeed a very relevant finding. Uh, agreed. And um, can I ask you one more question about this case, Friedman? Say the patient complains of really bad fatigue um, to the point where she feels like she actually needs to take a nap in her office in the middle of a busy working day. Um, would this influence your treatment decision? Um, ab absolutely. Um, again, I would try to find out first what, what, what's going on. Is there a certain cause for fatigue could be identified? Again, uh, depression, uh, sleep disorders are highly relevant. But, but given that we wouldn't find uh, any additional factors uh, underlying or contributing to fatigue, uh, I would again try to put her on a more efficacious um, a drug. Uh, because we have immunological um, data also from, from resting state fMRI, for example, that fatigue is related to impaired functional connectivity, which of course, again, is related to the inflammatory processes going on in the brain. So again, here, trying to, um, you know, take the sledgehammer and try to, to halt inflammatory disease activity with a highly efficacious drug might be helpful here. And in this regard, again, it is a very, very, very big step, uh, an important step forward that the Punisimo trial, the Optimum study, um, um, used the fatigue score and could show that Punisimo was superior to teriflunomide in terms of improvement of fatigue. So perhaps I would put her on Punisimo then. 
Great. And as we talked about earlier, um, cognitive disability as well as fatigue are probably, according to patients, um, some of the most debilitating um, symptoms. And I think Friedman's approach of kind of approaching it holistically first and trying to rule out um, um, reversible causes. But if it's clear that it's related to the MS, approaching it aggressively um, is really important. Um, so just to wrap up this case, um, say we have the same 32 year old patient and I tell you that, um, you know, that initial relapse she had about 12 months ago was a motor relapse and she has residual weakness in her left leg. Um, and a few weeks ago, she had an infratentorial relapse where she had imbalance and ataxia for a few weeks and still has mildly impaired tandem gait. And so when you see her in the clinic, um, she has, say, an EDSS of around three. Um, and then when you scan her, she has a very heavy lesion burden with uh, nearly 20 lesions in the brain and three cervical spinal cord MRI lesions. Um, what would you say in terms of uh, treatment options for a patient like this um, from the get-go? Oh, thank you. I would, I would in such a case even be, be more inclined to start her on a, on a highly efficacious uh, drug, uh, nafalizumab perhaps, ofratumumab, um, um, ocrelizumab, one, one of these three probably. And ag agree completely. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes it can be challenging because in different parts of the world, you may not necessarily have access because of insurance policies to all of these um, infusion kind of therapies that we think of as highest efficacy. But, um, you know, theoretically, if we had access to them, I think uh, uh, Friedman's approach illustrates um, the importance of uh, early aggressive treatment, even from the very beginning, when it's very clear that somebody has prognostic factors that um, are not looking very good. Um, so um, thank you very much, Friedman, for this really uh, fruitful discussion. I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground in the last half hour or so. We talked about you know, the complexity of treatment decision-making in MS, um, the benefit of all of these newer therapies and new data that come with these therapies. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, I think we are getting closer to being able to uh, provide um, tailored individual um, treatment um, for people living with MS. And I think obviously the ultimate goal is to improve um, the quality of life of um, all of our patients. So um, just wanted to thank you very much um, for taking the time. It's been a real pleasure having this discussion with you. And so to our audience, thank you for participating in this educational event and uh, very much hope um, that um, it was useful. Um, and please remember to continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation because it helps us to improve um, the content of future uh, programs. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.